Not yet. Not yet. Sir. Now or later? No, you can switch on. So are we ready? So welcome everyone to the third Stephen Pisano Memorial Lecture. I welcome you all. I welcome also our main speaker, Ari van der Koy. I've learned how to pronounce that name. Hopefully it was acceptable. So I'm going to leave it to Dominic Irodarayaj to present something about the lecture and also to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Father Rector. Professor Stephen Pisano, or simply Steve, as he was fondly known, dedicated decades of his scholarly years here at the Pontifical Biblical Institute to the painstaking but necessary task of textual criticism. On October 7, 2019, when he suddenly passed away, we painfully parted ways with a dedicated teacher, meticulous mentor, a caring colleague. Nonetheless, in keeping with our faith tradition, a commemoration both to honor Steve and to continue his legacy has been set in motion in 2020 in the form of an annual memorial lecture. With two lectures in the last two academic years, one each on the Old and the New Testaments. This year we turn it again to the Old Testament, particularly to the prophetic book of Isaiah. Speaking of textual criticism and the book of Isaiah, one cannot but mention the widely published and well received works of Professor Ari van der Koy, Professor Emeritus at the University of Leiden. It is therefore my pleasant duty this morning to briefly introduce the speaker of this year's Pisano Memorial Lecture. For over two decades, Professor Van der Koy was a full professor of the Old Testament studies in the Faculty of Theology at Leiden University. Besides textual history and a textual criticism, of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, some select research areas of Professor Van der Koy include the Isaiah volume of the Biblia Hebraica Quinta, Septuagint studies, Targum and Peshitta studies, and scholars, scribes, and translators in ancient Judaism. Numerous publications, including a dozen books, mark his long and a dedicated research journey. In addition, he has held various key roles in a variety of editorial committees and projects. Professor Van der Koy was the president of the prestigious biblical body, Yosuth, the International Organization for the Study of the Old Testament from 2001 to 2004. This morning, he will address us on the topic, Mistake or method on the evaluation of ancient witnesses of the book of Isaiah in light of ancient scholarship. Professor, please. Thank you. Well, let me first of all thank Professor Kolarczyk and his colleagues for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And it's really a great pleasure for me. It's OK, so you can hear me. Uh, a great pleasure to deliver this lecture in memoriam of Steve Pisano at the Pontificio Istituto Biblico in Roma, to put it that way. I know Steve already for a long time, since we met at the start of the Quinta project in 1990, more than 30 years ago. We have been collaborating as members of the editorial committee for a long time, from that year until 2019. 
His expertise, wisdom, and friendship were always very much appreciated. In the first decade of the project, in the 90s, we usually met as a committee for a whole week, once a year, for a whole week. Not only a few days, but a whole week. And in 1997, we did so in Rome. Usually we met in Switzerland, because Fribourg is an important place for the Quinta history. But once we met in Rome in 1997, and Steve, also in October, 5th to 11th October. Steve had arranged for us a stay in the Casa Internazionale del Clero. It's no longer named that way, I think, but that was at the time. Which for me as a Protestant layperson was quite an experience. And furthermore, he was able to arrange for us a visit to the Vatican Library. That was very interesting. And he showed us a famous item in the library, a volume that was entitled Targum Onkelos, but which actually, as was discovered by the Spanish scholar <coughs> Diaz Majo in 1949, turned out to contain a new Targum for the Pentateuch, Targum Neophyti, a very important discovery at the time. In this lecture, as you can imagine, I will say and discuss a few elements related to my Quinta work. And as has been said already, it's my job to prepare the edition of Isaiah for this Quinta project. Uh, by the way, I do it not only myself. One of my former PhD students, Miriam van der Forum Kroegs, is also doing part of it. She is doing chapters 56 to 66 and the rest of the book is my job. I can tell you, dealing with the ancient business of Book of Isaiah is fascinating. And compared to other books of the Hebrew Bible, the work of the edition on the edition of Isaiah is also quite special. Because of some interesting features. First of all, the large number of manuscripts from Qumran, among which, one com among which one complete copy of the book, the famous scroll called 1Q Isaiah A. This is one complete scroll, more than seven meters long, and containing the whole book. Second point, the Greek of Isaiah which, unlike most of the other books of the Septuagint, differs in many passages from MT, and often markedly so. A third, the Targum to Isaiah, represents a most interesting version, as it contains, more so than other books of the Targum Jonathan to the Prophets, a large number of interpretive renderings, which are revealing from the point of history of interpretation of the book of Isaiah. And finally, the Vulgate of Isaiah is a special case because it's interesting to study this Vulgate, this Latin version, in combination with the commentary on Isaiah by Jerome. Because the commentary is a valuable tool for interpreting the Vulgate in many cases. When doing my job in dealing with all kinds of TC, that means textual criticism, cases, I regard myself sitting together at a round table with the people that produced either the MS, the manuscripts of Qumran, or the versions of the book involved. I am discussing, so to say, with them, asking them in cases of divergences what do you mean by this? How did you do this? Other vorlage or otherwise? And why did you do so? Treating all of them, the scribes of the Qumran manuscripts and the translators of the versions, as colleagues. 
In this lecture, I shall explain why I do regard them colleagues. I will do so by focusing on a specific issue relating to the evaluation of ancient witnesses of Isaiah and the issue of what I call mistake or method. Initially, I was planning to do it for the Greek of Isaiah, but also for the Qumran school, but it turned out to be too much of the good. So uh, I have only a paper, a lecture on the Greek of Isaiah. <coughs> The only, that's the only version I will concentrate in this lecture. And as we will see, the image of translator is the issue at stake. Mistake or method. In order to make clear of what I have in mind, I start with presenting an example from the Greek of Isaiah. Isaiah 24, verse 23. The MT reads, the moon, Levina, will, come, will be confounded, and the sun, Gamma, ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion, etc. The Greek reads, the brick, Haplintos, will be dissolved, and the wall, Totegos, will fall, because the Lord will reign in Zion. Scholars are divided in evaluating the divergent in this case. Brick instead of moon, and wall instead of sun. True, most scholars agree that the equivalents in Greek are due to another vocalization of the lexemes concerned. So, levena instead of levana, choma instead of gamma. But even so, their assessment differs. Some are of the opinion that the rendering of both words is a mistake. For example, Otley, 1906, quote, the whole divergence of the verse seems to arise from a change of pointing of le vana, le vena. Lamet bet non hei. Both words are rightly rendered in Isaiah 30, 26, that was okay, but in this case it's not okay, according to Otley. Bill Berger, in his commentary on Isaiah, has the same view. The Septuagint did not understand the rare word gamma for sun. He had it not verstanden. And as a result, he interpreted the other word, levana, incorrectly, falsch gedeutet. Others, however, hold a different view. Leo Preis, in his work Jüdische Tradition, 1948, he says the rendering of both words is not due to another vocalization. That's a bit exceptional, but this is in his point. On the contrary, the translator has read the text correctly because he is familiar with the meaning of both words as is clear from Isaiah 30, 26. In his view, the Septuagint actually applies the text, as does the Targum, to the end of the service of moon and of sun in the eschatological era. I quote the Targum, then those who serve the moon will be ashamed, and those who worship the sun will be humili humiliated. So there's still the moon and the sun in the text, but with a kind of explanation. And that's the way Price looks also at the Greek version. And um, I skip a few points because he, well, to, to, to put it this way briefly, the choice of brick, he's pre referring to other passages where the brick is used in a cultic context and the same applies to wall in a cultic context, but that's not important for the moment. Another scholar, in a recent study, 
Wilson de Angelia Cunha. <coughs> he shares the view that the rendering of both words is due to an adequate vocalization, but does not work hard, does not regard both words in Greek as mistakes. His argument is as follows. The translator was familiar with the meaning of both words, as is clear from 3026. Hence, the choice of both words should be taken seriously and be studied within the context of the Greek of Isaiah. In his view, the Greek taigos refers to a city wall which shall fall, which he argues, in light of other passages, allude to the theme of the fall of the city of the ungodly. The city of uh, the ungodly is the famous expression in Isaiah 25, verse 2, presumably a reference to Babylon, the Greek. This example, and there are many more of them, clearly reflect two different scholarly approaches. One being characterized by the idea of someone, a translator or a scribe, or sorry, a scribe that was part of my paper, including an example from Isaiah in Qumran. <clears throat> the idea of someone making mistakes, and the other view being characterized by the idea of someone making modifications by employing particular methods or devices in order to modify the text for interpretive purposes. I will now give some background information about the two approaches, as far as Greek of Isaiah is concerned. The first approach, which I call mistake, <coughs> I start with a quote from Otley again, because the work of Otley, more than a hundred years ago published, that was very influential. He states, the character of the divergences seems to agree with many of the observed weaknesses of the translators, of the translator. I mean the divergences, I said in the beginning, the Greek of Isaiah reflects many, many divergences between this version and the MT. And he goes on, difficult passages and words fail to get that you. One departure from the right track is often followed by more. Sometimes the result is a drop into paraphrase or stopgap rendering. Fisher, another scholar on the Greek of Isaiah, 1930. The Greek version, he says, is marked by a freie Übersetzungsmethode und auch Unbeholfenheit gegenüber schwierigen Texten. So a free method of translation and a kind of clumsiness as soon as the, Greek, the Hebrew is difficult, in difficult passages. As soon as the text is difficult, he struggles to make sense of it so good or bad as it does. And he has also a nice word, übersetzungnot, in a need for a translation. The translator sometimes resorts to Arabic to make something of it, which is a kind of emergency. And this also applies, according to Fisher, to cases of differing vocalization or interchanges or transposition of consonants. It's all aspects of the Übersetzungsnot. The underlying view in my, in my view is that a correct translation should be more or less literal version of the underlying text in Hebrew. The fact that a large number of passages in the Greek of Isaiah translated are very literal implies, according to this view, that the translator intended to produce a faithful rendering. 
Divergent renderings, therefore, are best understood as mistakes, being due to the difficult Hebrew of a book like that of Isaiah. As you all know, you can say, well, the book of Isaiah is not an easy text to read and translate, but anyhow, that's the view of this uh, regarding this approach. This way of assessing divergences is not only attested in older publications, such as those by Otley and Fisher, which long ago published in the first half of the last century. It's also found in more recent studies, e.g., as I showed you, the commentary by Wilberger, and most recently by Penner, who wrote in the series, Septuagint Commentary Series, a volume on the Greek of Isaiah. He does, if he discusses differences between Greek and Hebrew, does so in line with Otley. They share the image of translator struggling in cases where the Hebrew is regarded difficult. The result being guesses and mistakes. I now give an example of this approach, which is to be found in a recent piece of literature. And it, <coughs> and it has to do with the Greek version of Isaiah 9, verse 5. The MT reads, as you may know, for a child was born to us, a son was given to us, and the government came upon his shoulder. And his name was called Council of Wonderful Things, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, four names. The Greek, for a child was born to us, a son was even given to us, whose sovereignty was put upon his shoulder. And he name, his name was called messenger of great counsel. For I will bring peace, I will bring peace upon the rulers, peace and health to him. According to Annelie Emileus in 2007, the Greek in this case is a kind of rewriting that is based on errors and guessing and therefore should not be considered interpretation. I quote, the Hebrew text contains four throne names of the Messiah that the translator obviously did not understand. The interpretation of the difficult passage is built around a few items that have been analyzed in an incorrect way. The syntactic structure of the Greek is based on mere guessing. The translator simply panicked and looked for an emergency exit. One of the details concerned is the following uh, rendering, I will bring, ego axo, uh, where the Hebrew has avi, father, but then was misunderstood according to Emilius, as Avi, I will bring, he feel of bow. Although this all is in line with the approach of Otley and his Fisher, which actually is the case, Emilius' assessment is related to her view of translation technique, which is marked by a strong focus on the evidence of translational equivalence. The translation of the Greek of Isaiah, being in a large number of passages a more or less literal version of the Hebrew, presupposes, in her view, a translator who is able to produce a faithful rendering of the text. In difficult passages, here again you have the term difficult, such as Isaiah 9.6, however, the translator was not able to do his job in a correct way. Hence, he was guessing 
and making errors. Now we go to the second approach. This approach looks at the textual data in a quite a different way. To come back to Price again, he deals with all kinds of divergent renderings in the Greek of Isaiah and other books of the Greek Bible from a different angle, namely from the perspective of Jewish rabbinic tradition. Price first of all draws the attention to examples of renderings in the Greek which in content agree with interpretations found in rabbinic literature. But then next, and that's for us an important point, he notes a large number of cases which in his view are best understood as due to particular methods, devices, exegetical techniques, typical of rabbinic exegesis, a special method related to the so-called altegre reading. Altigray readings that include alternative vocalization. You know Altigray. Um, you should not read this way, but that way. That's the idea of this term or expression. It can be a different vocalization. It can also be changing consonants of graphic agreements. Raised dialect, for instance. Uh, hey and gate. That could also be part of the Altic Ray method of the rabbinics. And also interchange of consonants. I have a well, uh, an interesting example for you. In Genesis 2, verse um, 4, A, I think, when the, the creation of the heaven and earth are completed, then you have in Hebrew, behibar aan, when they have been, uh, when they were created of at the moment that he was creating them, behebare aan. According to an alter gray method, you can argue that the text could also be read as be Avraham. The same consonant. I like that. As I already said, alter gray means you should not read this way, but another way. So people were aware of the, um, let's say, the normal meaning of the text, but they were also able to change the text for interpretive reasons, as is well known from rabbinic exegesis. Furthermore, Price points out that in a number of cases, the Greek renderings can be explained on the basis of the theory of the bi-radical roots, being current among Jewish scholars up to and including the 10th century. The idea is that weak verbs are classified, that was the tradition, on the basis of the two strong consonants. <coughs> we have all kinds of forms, but to give an example, um, the verb yasaf or asaf have in common sp. That's the biradical root. And that's the way they were dealing with these verbs uh, in that time. And you can see it in the dictionary by David ben Abraham al-Fasi. It's very interesting. Thus, instead of analyzing and evaluating Greek renderings from a modern perspective, that of modern philology, Christ does so from the perspective of ancient Jewish tradition, in particular of exegetical techniques known from rabbinic sources. So to summarize the two approaches, the first one, an image of a translator of Isaiah he should do his work in a proper way by producing a more or less literal rendering and therefore divergent renderings have been evaluated, or should be evaluated from the perspective or are evaluated from the perspective of modern philology and considered to be mistakes. 
from that point of view. The second approach is that the image of translator was familiar with methods, exegetical techniques, known from rabbinic sources. And that implies an evaluation of divergent renderings from the perspective of ancient Judaism, which I called method. So here you have mistake and method. What to make of all this? Which approach is the preferable one? In our Quinter work, if we um, regard a particular reading better than the MT, we say this is the preferred reading. So I'm using now the term of the Quinta for preferred approach. In this part of my lecture, I will argue that I prefer the second approach. And my argument in this case is threefold. First, based on the harvest of research, research on the Greek after Otley and Fischer. Second, <coughs> in view of ancient Greek scholarship and methods of interpretation in that time. And third, the aspect of ancient literacy and the image of the translator from seen from that perspective. Research on the Greek of Isaiah after Otley and Fischer has led to a number of characteristics of the Greek of Isaiah. And I have listed some here uh, for you. Uh, first of all, the Greek is relatively good, koine, and there's also a feature of literary Greek, as has been shown by Lee. An interesting aspect, secondly, is the use of particles, tying clauses and sentences together. That was the dissertation by Philippe Lomagne. It has never been published, but it's a wonderful piece of work. And thirdly, a rich vocabulary and, by, and, and a great variety of lexical choices. Furthermore, a large number of minuses and pluses <coughs> are often due to stylistic preferences, also known from classical rhetoric style in the Hellenistic period. And the minor, by the way, in this case, has also a large chapter on cases of chiasmus in the Greek of Isaiah. Striking renderings of words and phrases being in some cases part of a theme or motive to be found in a number of passages in the book. And as another aspect is the interpretation of metaphorical language this is quite interesting because metaphorical language is quite well known. Interpretation of metaphors is very well known in the Targum, but within the Greek Bible, you find it only in Isaiah, except one case in Genesis. But in, in, in the Greek of Isaiah, you find cases of um, interpretation of meta metaphors. And finally, the Greek of Isaiah is marked by exegesis. So that's an interesting harvest, or a rich harvest, of research, put it very briefly, of course, but for the sake of argument, I think it's clear enough. <coughs> um, <coughs> and in light of these characteristics, one can say that a picture emerges, which is quite obvious, I think, of a translator who was highly educated, as he was familiar with the book as a whole, because you have a lot of cases where the Greek harmonizes with other passages in the book. He was also acquainted with Koine Greek, including literary Greek and things as classical rhetorical style. So a well-educated Jew doing the job. My second point concerns the ancient scholarship issue. Instead of evaluating divergences from a modern philo philological point of view, <coughs> I think Price is on the right track 
when evaluating divergences in the Greek versus MT from the perspective of conceptions and practices in antiquity. The difficulty, however, is that he, the sources he uses, rabbinic literature, date to a later period than the Greek of Isaiah. In order to deal, this to deal with this issue, we, have to, we will have a look into the cultural context of the Greek Bible, more in particular into scholarship of the time. As we will see, ancient Greek scholarship and philology is marked by rules and practices quite similar to the methods of rabbinic exegesis. It has been argued that the translator of the Greek of Isaiah is to be compared with the grammatikos, the grammarian in Alexandria or other places, denoting a scholar who was able to read while well, reading, you know, has two, two aspects, reading aloud for public or reading for yourself, for study. <clears throat> was able to read and interpret literary texts, such as the works of Homer. This, in my view, is helpful indeed for assessing the approach of the translator in the case of the Greek of Isaiah. You see there are places in both the Greek of Isaiah and Old Greek Daniel where the term grammatikos is actually used by the translator. And even in Daniel, you have an interesting case in 117a. Uh, and the Lord gave the young man knowledge and clever insight in every literary art. And grammatikai techne. That's the term of this field of study, of this, what grammatikos um, is doing, is using and is able to do things according to the grammatica techne. In this connection, I now would like to draw attention to two methods of interpretation being part of this grammatica techne. Analogia and etymologia. What do these term, terms stand for? Well, analogia, to put it, put it briefly, pertains to verbal forms and can be labeled form association. Etymologia, etymological interpretation, represents another technique of the grammaticos, being an interpretation of words on the basis of graphic or phonetic agreements. Let's start with analogia. In an article published in 1973, David Weisert <coughs> is discussing a number of variant readings in the Greek Bible, which he argues are best understood as resulting from linguistic conceptions in antiquity, which differed from our modern approach. Cases where the Greek is supposed to have read forms of the roots Gul, Gil, Galal, which are different from the forms in MT. That's his, his uh, example. And you see here the same thing, Gul, Gil, Galal. The basic is Get Lamet. That's the, also the background of that you can play around. The translators applied, likely so, methods which had a counterpart in Greek grammar of the time. That is to say, methods based on heuristic principle of the heuristic principle of analogy or form association. So they were able, from that perspective, to play around a bit with the text. As I already indicated, it's good to come back here to the theory of biradical roots. Because this theory easily fits in with the principle of analogia. This biradical roots is, of course, an issue of Hebrew. Analogia, on the other hand, is a case of uh, Greek texts, but um, it easily fits in with that kind of idea. <coughs> this principle 
may even shed light on phenomena in the Hebrew Bible. I have an example for you. In Genesis 30, 23, 24, the name Joseph has two explanations. One via Asaph, God has taken away, and one via Yasaf, may the Lord add. I'm not arguing that the biradical roots idea was already present in the, let's say, earlier times, but it, it's interesting to see that these kind of ideas um, shed some light on, on this uh, case in Genesis 13. So both are possible in interpretations. Well, you could say the one is the source G and the one is the source E, but that's another discussion. Both are possible interpretations. We now go to etymologia. In Greek scholarship, teachers offered etymologies for words while texts were being read. Students were taught that letters could be changed, interchanged, added or omitted, so long as the desired meaning was found. You can find this in the famous work by Gribiori. Actually, etymology was about exploring interpretive possibilities, as already Plato is indicating. When the ancients etymologize, they often already know the meaning of the word, but they have some things they want to teach or explain about the word <coughs> to find other interpretations. It may be added in this connection that etymologia as an interpretive technique is not only a part of Greek scholarship, but has also a parallel in Babylonian scholarship, so it's a bit earlier. When dealing with this method, Fram, in his study on Babylonian scholarship, <coughs> distinguishes between etymology <coughs> and etymography. It has to do with cuneiform script, <coughs> when you can change a bit and then you have a, a different uh, sound, a different word. So also kind of playing with details, in this case of cuneiform script. As may be clear, the conceptions of analogia <coughs> and etymologia are quite similar to methods in the rabbinic exegesis. Particularly as far as the rule of Altigre is concerned. <coughs> it's reasonable to assume that highly educated people, such as the translator of Isaiah, were acquainted with these conceptions of Greek scholarship of the time. Yet, it is also possible that he was acquainted with these kind of techniques <coughs> because the methods of rabbinic exegesis were earlier than only in the rabbinic times, but go back to the time of the Hellenistic era and were already at that time part of the skills of Jewish literati. That's also a possibility. And the latter seems likely indeed, as the methods involved go back to even earlier times, as noted above in case of Babylonia. I now come to my third point, the issue of literacy in antiquity. In recent studies, for instance, William Harris, Ancient Literacy, 1989, it has been demonstrated that literacy in antiquity was limited to a minority of professionals to be looked for among people belonging to upper-class families, as only wealthy people had free time for studying literature. The rather liberal arts, you, have free, you need free time to do that. As Ben Sira puts it, whoever is free from toil can become wise. So you need money. And that means you are a member of the um, wealthy families, which at the same time are influential families in that culture. 
book of scripture, the so-called ancestral books, according to Sirach, were literary creations, a category quite distinct from documentary texts. The ability of reading and studying the former required other skills, skills of a higher level, than was required for those who were engaged with documentary texts. It is therefore likely indeed that only highly educated people, scribes, but I would say in the sense of scholar scribes. I've always a difficulty with the word scribe, because a scribe can be a secretary. But scribe in Ben Sira and other places is actually a scholar scribe, or just scholars. And to, de to be distinguished from a scribe secretary. There's another connotation, but that's not fitting here. People being members of the intellectual elite belonged to the upper class in Jewish society. That is to say, the priestly aristocracy and lay nobility, roughly speaking. That's the two groups in ancient Judaism <coughs> which are important here. A few examples, the teacher of righteousness was a leading priest, and you know, he was also a scholar. And another one, Josephus, member of illustrious priestly family, is also to be mentioned. <coughs> and Jesus Sirach himself, who was a scholar belonging to the lay nobility. <coughs> so scholars able to read and interpret <coughs> books of scripture making up the literary heritage of the Jewish nation, that's another aspect, but also the ones who wrote new compositions being based on the study of biblical books or produced a translation of these books. Because we are dealing with the translator. And here comes in the point not only to write new compositions. And Jesus Sirach and his grandson in this connection may serve as examples. You know, uh, the grandson wrote about his grandfather, perhaps you know that passage, and so my grandfather Jesus, who had acquainted himself for a long time with the study, reading anagnosis of the law, and so on, and developed a thorough familiarity with them, and then he was able to write a new composition. And the latter, the grandson, produced the translation of the work of his grandfather in Greek, but he was also a scholar and knew the work of his grandfather quite well. By the way, Josephus can also be mentioned. He was not only able to read and interpret the Hebrew Bible, but also translate Hebrew or biblical books. He again was a scholar, bilingual, perhaps trilingual, because Aramaic was also part of their training. I come now to my final section of this lecture. <clears throat> A number of concluding remarks. Mistake or method? The second approach, method, is in my view the preferable one, as the three aspects discussed above, harvest of research, conceptions of ancient philology, and the issue of literacy strongly suggest. The other approach, mistake, Looking at divergences from the perspective of modern philology runs the risk of anachronism. Second, the translator of the Greek of Isaiah is not just a translator, but a scholar trained in reading and interpreting the Hebrew text, and well educated as far as the Greek language and skills of a grammarian are concerned. As a member of influential families, of one influential family, presumably, as I have argued elsewhere, member of, an, of the priestly family, he was a person also of social standing. That's also an interesting aspect because people belonging to the influential families were persons of social standing. And that's another aspect, I will not deal with that, that's the issue of authority within society. It's very important. Third, 
What about other witnesses of Isaiah? I've now focused on the Greek, but there are other witnesses which are very interesting. Well, I will make a few comments on them. First of all, the Talcum to Isaiah is most interesting, as I said in the, in the introduction, <clears throat> as it clearly represents a translation which is marked extensively so in the case of Isaiah by exegesis. The people responsible for this version, Aramaic, are to be looked for among leading priests, scholars, highly educated people like Josephus. In this connection, I'd like to come back to Isaiah 9.5, to look into the Targum. It's a child, the Targum reads thus, a child has been, well, it starts with the prophet said to the house of David, it was a plus. The child has been born to us, a son has been given to us, and he has taken the law upon himself to keep it. And his name has been called from before the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, existing forever. And then comes the name, the Messiah in whose days peace will increase upon us. So again, like in the Greek, a short name. So here too, the four names are not presented as throne names of the Messiah. On the contrary, the name of the Messiah is quite brief like in the Greek. However, within Targum research, no one would argue that the translator did not understand the Hebrew. Scholars agree that the Targum contains here a particular interpretation. Fourth, the Vulgate of Isaiah. As we know, Jerome was a great scholar was not only able to read Hebrew, but was also trained in classical literary studies. You have a wonderful uh, publication by Michael Graves on that. Moreover, he was well acquainted with the exegesis of the book, both among Jews and Christians. He was familiar with commentaries on the Greek of Isaiah, in particular the work by Eusebius of Caesarea. So he was really also a scholar doing his job. And the commentary, as I said in the beginning, is indeed a valuable tool for interpreting the Vulgate. Next point. As to the famous Qumran text of Isaiah, 1Q Isaiah A, it would lead too far. That's a pity, but there's no other solution to that problem, to discuss the issue at stake here, because there are a few similar issue, situation. <clears throat> here the question too is the image of the scribe. Is he a copiist? We will make all kind of errors, as some say, not everywhere, but in many cases, errors. Or is he to be looked for, that's my idea, as a scholar scribe who has changed the text for several reasons, not just having the intention to copy the text only, but to make a new text of it. Something like that. It's also a matter of perspective. Sixth point. Well, yes, that's also interesting. Um, the issue of modern translation techniques. Of, sorry, modern translation theories. I discussed this with Theo van der Lau. Maybe you know his name. It was a former student of, PhD student of mine, he was on a dissertation on uh, the use of uh, what you can do with the modern translation theories in the study of the Septuagint, a wonderful publication. And, um, well, <coughs> I agree with him that modern theories are indeed helpful. But, he says, one should note that these theories are based on modern translations and they lack the conceptual framework to deal with techniques such as Altikre and other methods current in antiquity. So you have again the issue to the modern scholarship and ancient scholarship. 
Finally, the picture of a round table. You know the idea of round table? Everyone is equal. Um, all of them scholars, as I said. And um, so no making a distinction between uh, the guy of the Greek is not that good and the guy of the Targum is very good. I all of them, all of them I got, I regard scholars to be equal, to be honest or modest uh, as a scholar. But there is a difference, of course, there's between modern scholarship and ancient scholarship. But that's the idea. And that is also the paradigm underlying my work for the Quinta edition. It also implies that textual criticism is not only a matter of textual history, but also related to a history of interpretation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Ari van der Kooi, for this excellent lecture, very stimulating indeed, uh, concerning the Septuagint of Isaiah. And I enjoy, enjoyed very much the, the notion of uh, talking, of thinking um, about the ancient translator as a colleague, and also the idea that um, often they are not making mistakes, there is method behind it. Uh, using the principle of analogy that you, ma you mentioned, maybe you could apply that to us today too. I keep saying to our students in the biblical that our professors here do not make mistakes. There is method. So <laughs> <laughs> there is method to the madness. So, um, yeah. <coughs> I hope I'm not extrapolating too much uh, the content of the lecture. But we uh, still have some uh, 10 to 15 minutes for interaction, uh, questions, uh, commentaries, if you want to comment something about the lecture. Our friend here, um, student of the PBI, Baba, has the mi microphone. Just raise your hand and he will come to you. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Ari, for this wonderful lecture. And uh, I certainly appreciate your image of a round table. That's what also what I've been doing so far for this same project. I have one question and then another. This uh, passage that you discussed on Isaiah 24, moon and wall. Now, if we think of the Hebrew words for that, those two Hebrew words are really, each of these are ambiguous. It can mean moon and bricks, and uh, equally the other. Now, how about ancient translators, scholars, knowing Hebrew, knowing also the two possible meanings? Really, it's not vagueness, but two possibilities, semantic possibilities. Uh, that would belong, I guess, method. So in this case, we cannot say, accuse the uh, Septuagint translation as ignorance. They had no choice because uh, Greek would not be able to produce the ambiguity of Hebrew. Now, I think this would go into that. Now, that leads to uh, a question that is similar to that. Wilderness in the desert, yeah. Prepare. Yeah. Now, he, uh, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia certainly thinks of uh, prepare in the wilderness because of the line division. But the Septuagint would, as we know, that's place it a uh, voice, a calling in the wilderness, and then the one. How would you treat this? This is a syntactic ambiguity not just words. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, well, about moon and sun, uh, the, the terms used there, as you know, are quite, well, in a sense, rare. But you have the same terms in Isaiah 30, 26. And uh, there it is quite clear that sun and moon, and also the Greek has there sun and moon. But not in this case. Um, well, in my view, as you have understand, uh, understood, this is also uh, an example just of a, a method. People are aware of two possibilities, 
Uh, well, you can say, as Obdia said, he, he was mistaken because he knew better. Uh, so he was mistaken because of a uh, mechanical error. By, but I, I, you agree also that that is a matter of ambiguity. But that the ambiguity is just uh, also part of the uh, method of analogia or uh, etymologia. It fits in all with all this. People were aware of the meaning X, and but are using now another meaning for a particular interpretation. And the same applies for me, in my view, to the, there are many examples of that, a differing, different division of the text on a syntactical level. It's not only in Isaiah 40, there are more passages. And where the Greek is combining words or taking together words from uh, verse X and including a few words of the next verse, well, next verse in empty then. It's the same freedom, or lao freedom, maybe uh, not a good word, but the same part of the method. Um, by the way, one should also realize that the Hebrew text underlying had no verse numbering. Uh, as you see from Qumran, you have some uh, little space making more room or indicating also kind of visions. And there you have some interesting examples of differing divisions from MT, at the same time also differing from the Greek. It's all in the game, I think. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the presentation, for the lecture. It was uh, very illuminating. I have uh, three questions. Uh, the first is related to the last point you made. Is um, Do you think that uh, Isaiah, the Greek Isaiah, has only one translator? Because there are several tendencies, it seems, uh, in, his, in his method, uh, or their method. So is it one translator? or several, maybe one, two, three translators that translated the book of Isaiah. Um, the second question has to do with the variants. We haven't, I mean, we discussed several um, reasons for these variants that we find in, uh, in the Septuagint, but um, we didn't discuss a, a re one reason, which could be that there is a variant in the Hebrew for Laga that he had, which, um, could be reason for some of the variants that, uh, that thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will have talk was in no better in the micro. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, well, the, the question of one or more translators is an ancient one. It was also already discussed long ago by people. But I think Ziegler in his famous work of Untersuchungen zu Greek Isaiah has argued quite convincingly as other scholars uh, also have said later on, that, that uh, one translator is quite well likely. Because in both parts of the book you have uh, similar issues of divergences and all kinds of phenomena which are the same in the first part if we talk about Isaiah 1 to 39, for instance, all that is a modern in the, uh, division, and the second part. But one could not exclude the possibility of two translators, but then I would say these two people were colleagues and uh, having uh, similar ideas and whatever. That might be possible, but uh, there are indeed some intriguing differences on translation style uh, between the first and the second half. Others have argued that chapter 36 to 39 should be uh, regarded as having been translated by another person. But um, in general, I agree that Ziegler, I think that Ziegler has argued quite convincingly on this point, that the they all share particular phenomena which at least makes plausible that one translator could have done the whole job. Perhaps I may add to this question another thing. Um, the translator as a scholar was not writing the text himself. You know that. Everything was done by dictation. But that's another aspect. I <coughs> have to left out. Have you, you had a, a second question? Oh, the variants, yes. Of course, we have to look at each case whether or not the Greek reflects a variant reading. 
in the, in, in the Hebrew. But you know, in the discussion of the Greek of Isaiah, already in earlier studies, it is generally said the Greek translation more or less reflects the MT tradition. And given the style of translation, all kind of, well, stylistic or other divergences, it's very difficult to prove or to make plausible that an other variant reading was um, at the background. But in some cases, I think there was a variant reading, yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really fascinating and uh, very interesting. Uh, I have a question uh, uh, first of a more general character. So do you think that what you have uh, presented to us here with uh, regard to uh, the Septuagint of Isaiah can be applied to other books that were translated, uh, other Jewish books that were translated into Greek as well? So is it more of a general picture what can be retrieved from that so that uh, translators were scholars more than uh, simply uh, scribes. And the second question, at one point uh, in your lecture you said uh, that uh, what uh, the translator or the scribe or the scholar is doing here is uh, related to rabbinic uh, methods of uh, exegesis. And when you, you said uh, that can perhaps be uh, drawn back to uh, earlier times when the rabbinic uh, uh, writings so, but what is uh, with uh, these uh, Greek uh, methods of uh, translating and interpreting texts, uh, ex especially in Alexandria, we have this Homeric uh, exegesis in Alexandria, mm -hmm. and they use uh, similar methods of mm -hmm. interpreting the, yeah. the texts of Homer. So, uh, is there such an intellectual atmosphere in Alexandria, so that the Jews were involved in such a uh, 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 atmosphere of interpreting texts in a certain way, and we can imagine this uh, scholar who dealt with Isaiah in, in such a milieu. Thank you. Well, to start with the last question, <coughs> um, I agree on that, yes. But my point is that if you look back to, of, if you look to the rabbinic tradition, it may well be that um, already within Judaism in the Hellenistic era, was a kind of acquaintance uh, uh, using this kind of tools for in reading and interpretation, which at the same time was also there in Alexandria, because then you have a kind of match. It's, it's, I think both aspects are there, in my view. That uh, It has been said before that rabbinic rules have not been invented by the rabbis, but go back to earlier times just because of these um, similarities and similar methods used by the Greek scholars. So, I, I agree with you, in the Alexandrian milieu or of other milieus, Jews were well, who were well educated, also in Greek language and, and reading and interpretation of texts. Uh, that was part of the Greek culture. But at the same time, it was perhaps also already part of Jewish tradition itself. That's my, well, <laughs> um, thinking. And the first question, that's an interesting one. The Greek of Isaiah has a special place in the Greek Bible. While in a sense, together with the old Greek of Daniel, first Esdras, which are regarded a particular group, and in a sense, similar to book, the Job version, and Proverbs. The other books in the Greek Bible are rather literal, um, but yes, it's not uh, so easy. I myself think that we should use this model for all the books. But every book, like Samuel, has a discussion of its own. And Jeremiah, for instance, with this uh, second edition issue, is also a discussion of its own. So that is, uh, yeah, makes things a bit more complex. But that's my idea, that uh, it should not only be, well, applied this model, as I do, to the Greek of Isaiah, but it may, it may be well be more easy, in my case, for making this model plausible, in a sense, more easy maybe than in the case of um, Jeremiah or Samuel. We will see. There on the left, uh, Joseph. Yes. Joseph. 
Yes, thank you again for the very insightful uh, lecture. I really appreciated you directing our attention back to sort of the ancient Jewish sources and traditions. Um, and sorry, uh, and not simply to read uh, the Septuagint with our Greek grammar and syntax finding fault, not trying to appreciate the sort of feel for the language and interpretation. Um, and just to go back to um, to go back to the, uh, the the last point, I think you know one thing you didn't mention, but I you could sort of forgive scholars in the early 20th century for um, for their reservations about sort of rabbinic literature and its dating and how far back does it go. But I think a very strong argument as well that would support your case is, of course, the Qumran findings, where you do have Pesharim and you have a Pesher of Isaiah, of course. Uh, and I'm thinking of a case like Isaiah 54, where you have, similar to your case from t chapter 24, you have elements of the city, you know, the structural elements of the city, then being connected, of course, with the community, with the Yachad in some way, um, which, again, I think just supports what you're saying and suggests that, um, uh, yeah, that, the, that these earlier Jewish inter interpretations, the argument that someone like Selig Mincen, I think, is in many ways vindicated by, um, by that sort of Qumran material as well. So thank you again for, uh, for, for, for calling our attention to that. Thank you. So maybe we would have time for one last question. Yes, uh, maybe here, Sebastian. Oh, sorry. Uh, Professor van der Kooy, thank you very much for your lecture. You uh, painted for us two images of how to view the ancient translator, whether as someone who should have translated quite exactly, and then any departures from that would have been a mistake, or otherwise, and a translator who interpreted the text or reinterpreted the text in his own way that doesn't necessarily concord with the original interpretation of, of the original text. Now, in both cases, this represents a departure from the original text. So how would these two differing images of the translator impact um, the work of a text critic, for instance, who is trying to reconstruct um, the original text or the Ausgangs text um, in, in whatever way you, you choose to call it. I mean, would we say that, for instance, in the example of the moon versus um, wall, that the Masoretes pointed the, the text incorrectly? Um, in what way would, would the differing interpretations impact uh, the work of a text critic? Thank you, yes. Um of course, I have put things a bit black and white in this paper for the sake of uh, clarity. Um, in detail, one has to study each passage in its own right to see what's going on in the MT. And, and an important aspect in that case is always the context of the book in Hebrew, uh, the context in the Greek, the context in the Targum or whatever. And. Um, and the issue of textual criticism, indeed, we are looking for, um, well, we are discussing the question, is the MT tradition a good one? I'm not, we are not saying in the Quinta that it was the original text, that's not our goal, but to say, well, which reading is the better one, or the more original? And that's already quite a thing. And um, it, that's a matter of um, evaluating and weighing the evidence. Uh, in, in, within the context of a particular version. And, um, well, given the, uh, as the, 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 the complexities of the Greek Isaiah, in general, I am very reluctant to, 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 uh, to say, well, this is a variant reading, because in many cases, it's possible to evaluate differences in light of these uh, ancient techniques. So that makes one more reluctant to claim, as people did in the past, uh, variant readings behind the Greek. So in that sense, it's very important for your weighing the evidence in, 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 in all kinds of details, whether or not the Hebrew of the MT is really the better text, or uh, perhaps there are maybe other texts behind it. It's, that's, 
I did not discuss 24, 23 in detail. That would be a little too far. But then you have also to look in other versions, such as the Targum in this case is also very interesting. Um, and Price makes use of that um, rendering. But I think he is mistaken in this case because he should have looked, first of all, within the, um, as Wilson de Angelo Cunha did so quite well, in the context of the Greek as a whole, to see what's going on here. Not only focusing, as people did in the past, only on these words uh, in an atomistic way, but to look at the whole character of a version at, at the same time. So you can give the word to our rector. He wants to ask a question, then he can also conclude our well, lecture. Thank you very much, Ari. This is a, a kind of a simple question. It's about hermeneutics. The way you understand these translators as being scribes and scholars kind of excludes the possibility of them making any errors. So I wonder if this can apply to contemporary scholars, that any interpretation is not a mistake. What do you say? That's an interesting question. Well, in antiquity, people would say, well, my interpretation is correct. And another colleague, a colleague from Qumran, because, you know, if you look in the Greek Isaiah of in Qumran or the Targum, we have also behind these versions to reckon with different communities. I did not deal with the issue of parties and groups in Judaism. Judaism was not one uh, community. You had several communities, parties, and every party had its own interests. And that's reflecting also in these versions to some extent. Not in every detail, but is there are cases where, the, where you find this. So it's, um, it's not that simple. And modern philology does not allow for everything. Different from antique scholarship, I would say. Well, again, I didn't realize I was to conclude this. But listen, thank you, ver thank you very much. And let's give a good applause for all the discussion that ensued as well. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Sometimes I was not close enough, perhaps here. I heard you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. He told me. He told me. Christian Arabic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah.